Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, the most rewarding and secure place is being in charge of your own destiny with John McNeish. We talk about likability and credibility, knowing what good looks like and planning for success, and why Newcastle is a great place to start a business. Born in Preston, Lancashire, John attended Sedbury School in Cumbria, where his rugby career took off. He signed his first professional rugby contract in 96 and spent the next three years juggling university life along with club, university and representative rugby. Since 1999, John has been building and leading consumer and retail recruitment companies across the UK and Europe, supporting a vast portfolio of clients and candidates from entrepreneurial SMEs through to many of the world's leading brands. John launched McGregor Black in 2017, the complete talent partner to the consumer sector. With a head office in Newcastle and a specialist team of 14 in Newcastle, Leeds, Manchester and London, when John is not busy with the family, he likes to find time to travel, watch a little Munster rugby, entertain friends and tend to his herd of Dexter cattle at his home in Northumberland. Beginning of my uh, childhood, um, I was known the child, um, born in Lancashire, uh, raised in Cumbria, um, both parents working, sent off to boarding school at the age of seven. Um, which was enjoyable because as an only child I was bored at home. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was a, a really sort of like hard up bringing uh, in that kind of still had corporal punishment. Um, so you still got a cane if you were naughty. Um, and um, enjoyed sports um, and realised that sports were probably my main passion rather mm. than the classroom. Um, went to Seba, famous rugby school um, where I thrived in sport again. Um, and worked my way through to you know graduating, going to university in, in Northumbria again, chosen because of my sport, um, and um, studied surveying, um, something that I was not interested in, mm. um, but thought you know everybody else was doing it that I was leaving school with, and I'll go along and do the same thing, and and I think that would be one of the things that I'd probably change, spend more time looking at a course that I actually would maybe get some value out yeah. of, you know, marketing mm-hmm. or business or management. Mm-hmm. Uh, but inevitably graduated as a planning and development surveyor and worked for an environment agency in Leeds for a year. Um, and my first appraisal with my uh, boss at the time, who was an ex-lawyer from Hammonds, he'd gone into public practice to benefit from some of the flexi time and you know good pension and the, mm. the structures. I said, look, you know, you need to be in a commercial environment. This isn't for you. And I was horrified because I thought I'd made a mistake or you know not worked hard enough. But he was quite right. So uh, a friend of mine who. Um, I played rugby with them, had a cousin that worked in a recruitment firm, went along for an interview, hadn't got a clue what it meant or the concept of paying money to find people um, so early on in my career, but um, fell into that and, and worked for a firm who was a real sort of like Wolf of Wall Street style culture. Learn- <laughs> yeah, <it was> all- <laughs> everything apart from the midgets, but we, oh. we, 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 le- we learned everything <laughs> apart from the right things to do. Yes. Um, so it was the complete opposite of what you're supposed to do, uh-huh. really. Um, you know, poor database, poor systems, you know, poor client and candidate integrity and poor service levels. So I flipped it on its head, did the exact opposite and became quite successful quite quickly. Mm. Um, and then... Got a contract to come back up to the northeast uh, for West Hartlepool, uh, moved back up here and joined a small uh, company with about 15 people in Newcastle and built out a national brand in the consumer space, mm. um, grew that team and, and then replicated that model across eight European countries um, until we as a team built the business to about 140 heads and then sold that to private equity in 2010 Mm -hmm. uh, which is an interesting journey Um, had some time abroad six years um, combined in Paris and Geneva um, and then moved back in 13 uh, ran that business under private equity ownership for a brief period of time before I left in Mm -hmm. 13 Um, went down to Leeds to merge uh, five small uh, recruitment brands with a team of uh, executives um, new systems infrastructure brands um, and strategy and then left there and moved back to the northeast um, and launched McGregor Black in April 17 um, and today we've got a team of uh, 12 uh, based in Leeds Manchester London and Newcastle mm-hmm. 
Um, our strategy is to be uh, the complete talent partner to the consumer and retail sectors. So we recruit at management and executive level across six key job functions mm. uh, on a permanent and interim basis. Um, and it's been a great success so far. Um, we've got some fantastic people that work for us, a variety of experience levels, um, some people that have worked for me before, some people that are completely new that we've trained and developed already into consultants, which is how you build your businesses by developing your own mm. culture and DNA and, and talent pool. Um, and it's great to be back in the centre of Newcastle working on both UK and international briefs, <coughs> which is um, always nice to see because you don't just need to recruit in your backyard. Mm. Um, but, you know, last week we were in Paris, the week before we were in Milan. We recruited across North and South America. We recruited across Asia, um, all from Newcastle with, you know, local consultants here. So, um, you know, it's been a whirlwind of a journey so far, but... Um, the first opportunity for me to completely own my own company mm. um, and put into practice all of the learnings and experiences that I've gained over the last 20 years or so. Um, and the future's looking pretty pretty positive. Excellent. Why, uh, why Newcastle? Why so, sort of set up here so in your main office? Yeah, my wife um, is from the northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, my two children were born here. Um, my family heritage is also from here. Um, so there's some personal reasons. When we moved back from Switzerland, we bought a house near Morpeth, mm -hmm. settled there. Um, in recruitment, um, if you're recruiting in a local market, you have to be on the, on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but because we are an industry expert, we recruit all over. You know, so we've got okay. clients that produce seafood in Inverness through to whiskey you know, in the Western Hebrides through to you know, beer in London. So it doesn't mm -hmm. really need to be on the doorstep. Okay. Um, cost of operating. Um, good um, pool of talent for employees mm -hmm. um, and um, I think those are the most important things we really when you're looking to build a team you know can you hire the people to work for you are you going to be able to operate in a cost-effective way um, and can you maintain you know that balance of uh, uh, a good lifestyle for your employees and yourself Hmm. Uh, whilst also doing a good hard day's work as well. So Newcastle offers all of that. Um, the reverse hmm. would be said of somewhere like London, which is high cost, hmm. you know, very competitive, yes. um, whereas Newcastle has a good blend of the two and um, you know, is becoming an increasingly popular place for people to be based from. Um, uh, the same things were said when I previously uh, was part of the growth journey of my previous company. Um, but we've also relocated a couple of people to join McGregor Black from elsewhere that have quite happily come up here and settled very quickly. So mm -hmm. I think that's a good testament to the, the region as well. Mm. It's a very welcoming region, isn't it? I find, always find that different. You go down to London and, you know, oh, someone just half looked at me, I better look away. Whereas up here, you know, you just sit in the queue somewhere and Absolutely, in yeah. the shops. and Yeah, I mean, I always used to say that the further north you go, the friendlier people get, mm. which I still believe. Um, and over the years, I've recruited and brought people from all over the world um, at one point you know, we had 17 different nationalities working for me in a team in Newcastle. Um, mm. And it was never a place that we had any difficulty recruiting people to. Uh, and in fact, a lot of people, especially the French, typically wanted to stay because they liked the Anglo-Saxon culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a, an easier place than many to, to recruit into. And it's got a great combination of country, coast, city, uh, culture. Mm. You know, it's got a bit of everything. Yeah, that Thanks. does. Excellent. So, in terms of this is this being your first proper you own it all, um, what have been the sort of the lessons that you have learnt from previous employers and previous companies that you know the, the key the key things that you've put into place in McGregor Black? Yeah, it's a good question, um, and it's one that I'm absolutely crystal clear on. Mm. Um, and I often advise people towards this: you need to learn your experiences, learn what uh, the failures and, and, and the loopholes are. Um, ideally on somebody else's time <laughs> so uh, so um, you know all of the risk is somebody else's when you're employed mm. um, and and I've had a you know a very very varied and exciting um, career so far where I've seen lots of things go well and other things go wrong um, and and what to do and when mm -hmm. um, and know what good looks like so you learn that um, ideally initially um, and when it comes to it the timing's got to be right uh, from a funding perspective, obviously, um, you've got to be able to afford to do it. Um, and here at McGregor Black, our growth is all through profit. Mm. You know, we, we, we have no external funding. Um, 
although funding is available you know to to people setting up businesses and and, and there's lots of different routes that you can take um, but that was something that I was very keen to do mm. um, so um, you need systems infrastructure um, you need a very clear plan um, you need to have an environment that's um, all encompassing to attract good people um, they need to be well rewarded um, you've got to set a culture um, so from the outside it may look relatively straightforward you buy a you know virtual office space and you set it up with nice desks and computers but actually underpinning that is a very very complex web of um, plans forethought um, and my partner um, Rob who is our finance director and I worked extensively on that for some time before mm. we launched the business um, in April of 17 um, to make sure that everything was in place so when we bring people in they know exactly where we are today they know exactly where we're going to go to in the future and um, they know how we're going to do that what it's going to look like um, and it's all about mm. getting the right people to deliver the right results the marketplace is there um, you know we've got over three and a half thousand clients registered on our database today of consumer businesses that we aspire to work with at some point in the future mm -hmm. um, and with the ratio of clients per head in fee earning um, you know we know how big that team needs to be to deliver a certain goal so <clears throat> you've got that plan in place and people buy into that because they want to be inspired and they want to be led and yeah. they want the opportunity to be part of that journey so it takes away some of the uncertainty as well yes yeah i mean there's a lot of businesses that you see who remain five or six ten people for 10 15 years because mm. they may want to but equally i think a large part of that is because they don't necessarily know how to actually scale it up mm. no there was, a, there was a couple of years ago there was massive um, government interest in scale mm -hmm. up businesses um you see that report and uh, it, it's interesting that, some, yeah, that what you said. Some people, some people just don't want to, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and then they felt shame about mm -hmm. just wanting their kind of. I'm happy with my five people, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if if it's a lifestyle business that they want, then that's great. Yeah. Um, but you know, certain customers will want to work with certain types of recruiters, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with certain reach and capability. So you know it means that the competition would be selective as well. No, definitely. So the plans are for world domination then? Um, <laughs> take it step by step. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll grow out in Newcastle, we'll continue to have our head office here, mm -hmm. continue to look for good people, um, look to extend into new office space um, in the UK and then a footprint into Europe within the next 10 years. Is there, uh, I mean, uh, politically <laughs> with all that's been going on, is that... Do you think that's affected? It's good to hear perspectives of companies hiring. Is there sort of uncertainty? Are we going to hold off? What's kind of the feel in the marketplace, would you say? Um, so having been through the 2009-2012 recessions, both in the UK and abroad, I'm very mindful of keeping a positive mental attitude. Mm -hmm. You've got to ask the question, how large is the recruitment market that you're trying to get a piece of? Mm -hmm. and therefore are those barriers really up so positive mental attitudes um, there's still lots and lots of business opportunities out there mm -hmm. change brings recruitment need mm -hmm. whether good or bad so we've got certain trends in the market we are doing an extensive amount of recruitment in digital um, mm -hmm. huge volume of opportunities in digital mm -hmm. um, ranging from MDs that are purely coming in as digital focused leaders through to digital managers setting up platforms for the first time for various businesses okay so that's a change in the retail footprint and the economy. Mm. Um, we've then got lots of interim, um, but then we've also got companies who are taking interim away as a cost-saving exercise. Um, mm. Supply chain uh, is also uh, increasing in recruitment. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of recruitment uh, needs for people looking at where a business is bottlenecking, you know, where are their issues. Um, so we've seen a, a change in the types of jobs that we're recruiting. Um, there are some businesses who have put major projects on hold because of Brexit. There are some businesses affected by import and export of raw materials mm. and then sales. But there's still a hell of a lot of recruitment need. Mm. Um, and the national businesses that don't necessarily get affected by those international uh, challenges are continuing as they are. Mm. So, yes, it inevitably will affect things. Labour in some of our more labour-intensive producers and the protein and produce sector where they're employing thousands of people to work in factories mm -hmm. that's also a big concern mm -hmm. um, but you know on, 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 on our micro level of um, recruitment it's not materially mm -hmm. affected as at all yet okay 
<laughs> nearly said, if it happens at all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> uh, okay, dokie. So if, what would your advice be to those who are setting out in, in terms of taking the leap into mm. running their own company for the first time? Yeah, I think irrespective as to whether it's recruitment or anything else, um, it's the most rewarding um, professional journey that you can go on. Mm. Um, my brother-in-law is quite a high-profile um, executive coach and public speaker, has been for many years. He once said to me a long time ago that the most rewarding and actually secure place that you can put yourself in is to be in charge of your own destiny. Mm. Um, and never quite resonated with me until you do do that um, mm. because everything you do every effort you put in should directly reward you mm-hmm. and, and that's not always the case and you know we'll interview you know many candidates every day who are t- working for big corporates and are complaining that all of the effort and energy that they put in and the increased mm. sweat and tears and so on doesn't necessarily pay back mm-hmm. and um, you know that's a that's a big a big focus as to why people want to do it mm. um, you've got to have a very clear plan um, you've got to know why your proposition or your business could be different, mm-hmm. what the value is. Um, so you've got to do a lot of research. Um, you've got to speak to a lot of people who've been through that similar journey. And equally, I see lots of people who do set up their own businesses in different forms where it fails. And actually, to the untrained eye, even you could see, well, obviously it's going to fail because of the proposition, the price, uh, the product, um, the structure the location could be all sorts of things Mm. Um, so research planning preparation um, and also doing it at the right time where you know you've got the experience that we talked about before and you can benefit from either yourself or other people who've been there and done it Mm. and know what good looks like because it should and could be a matter of just replicating that And, and that's what we've done here with McGregor Black Um, similar to my experiences before it's replicating and doing all of those good things well and again Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, so my advice would be to prepare well to plan well to spend a lot of time thinking about it and from a funding perspective make sure that you know exactly you know what the numbers should look like could look like and stress test it um, so that um, if the worst case happens you know you've got a plan B as well Mm -hmm. Um, and then throw yourself into it 100 miles an hour enjoy every moment of it and you know hopefully step back at some point recognize that everything you've done has been you know because you did it and it's well deserved that's excellent mm-hmm. excellent do you want to talk about um your childhood has been very different from most mm. people's childhood i remember i went to boarding school but i went when i was 12 but i was looking after the eight-year-olds yeah, as yeah. well yeah. and it, yeah. it kind of hurt my heart a little bit that such little little humans <laughs> were sent off to boarding school I suppose. yeah so my parents were um uh, relatively old when they had me mm. so my father was 40 when i was born and um and and had their careers um so literally from a childcare perspective and having no family nearby mm. uh, the the natural choice was to go to school um, so so went to the school from four but started boarding weekly from seven okay. and then terminally from 13 um, and yeah it was a big Georgian mansion house in Cumbria um, it was short 12 months of the year <laughs> um, it was sleeping on World War Two horse hair mattresses Lovely. and I remember every single night um, the prefects would go around the dorms um, and each child had to neatly fold up as you would do in a retail shop today Mm. your black shoes polished under your chair your little cord shorts touching the edge of the chair and then your shirt folded up touching the edge of the cords your grey jumper on top with your black and white striped blazer on the back and then you were judged to 0.5 of a percent Um, with a maximum score of 10 and each child was judged in each dorm every single night for the entire term and at the end of the entire year if you won that competition you got a bookmark for £10 (laughs) Um, (laughs) but um, my dorm New World won every single year Mm. and and I have a little bit of that uh, sort of like OCD when I come into work every morning with my papers my pens my computer everything's got to be right mm-hmm. I've got to be prepared and then bang I know that I'm you know fit for purpose so it's an interesting way that it um, 
you know, ta- cha- you know, tailors your behaviour, yeah. makes you work and think in a certain way. Um, you know, it was a proper team performance. You never want to let anybody down. Mm. Um, and then that went through into my sporting career as well. That I thoroughly enjoyed and was a highlight of my life until I met my wife. Mm. Um, and still some of the happiest days of my life. And some of the most um, enjoyed, you know, achievements as well. Um, and knowing what good can look like as well. You know, people that perform at a high level in anything. Can, mm. You know, over the years, mm. I've always looked for two different attributes in people, and that's likability and credibility. Um, and if they've got both of those, you want to work with them, and you enjoy working with them. Mm. Mm. And that's the winning formula. And I've also seen people that have only got one of them, and that's blindingly obvious as well. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, but usually people that work with me have had some form of um, sporting or theatrical or interest excess where they've mm. really been passionate about something mm. um, and one of our colleagues here you know that works for us at McGregor Black uh, is into amateur dramatics and uh, you know performs and is very passionate about that and that comes through um, because they take pride in that um, others are more sporty and have performed at a national level mm-hmm. um, in various sports and therefore you know that again comes through because they've got that winning mentality it's uh, that's no quitting, you know that uh, resilience, that tenacity, that drive, that continuous ambition that you need to overachieve, mm-hmm. um, and that's a very powerful attribute to have in business um, because you just need to be able to pick yourself up and get on with it again, yeah. and just go through it twice as hard. No, that makes sense. It's like you can you can see where that t- determination and that planning comes from I think Mm -hmm. my boarding school was nothing like that (laughs) (laughs) Um, thank god Um, (laughs) yeah it's closed down now (laughs) no it was yeah it was significantly less Mm -hmm. regiment strict disciplined I think they got rid of corporal punishment before we turned up I, I'm led to believe that our parents had to sign a letter saying, yes, you can beat my child. Um, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that was the whacker for minor offences and the cane for serious offences. Um, and you were made to go and stand with your nose against a cold marble fireplace. Um, often the waiting in itself would be the worst punishment and they'd just let you go, but uh, but it just depended on what you'd done. No, um, it's bonkers, but that's probably given you your mm, drive for determination yeah, and laser yeah, yeah. focus yeah. as well. Absolutely, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can totally see sport doing that as well. And rugby is a great sport, I find, for um, camaraderie, respect for authority. Yep. Um, certainly things that I've picked up mm-hmm. playing that as well. One of, one of the things that's changed is that the game's become so um, fast-paced that everybody looks like the old back row forwards. Yes. They're all six foot four, <laughs> 17 stone, 100 metres in 10 seconds. When I was playing, um, there was... Uh, a closer sort of like business analogy in that there was a place for everybody mm. Mm. so if you were short and fat you were a prop if you were tall and thin you were a second, second row, row yeah. <coughs> you know if you if you were short and skinny you were a, you were a number eight uh, you're a number nine uh, scrum half um and therefore there was a place for everybody every shape and size mm. and that was a great analogy yeah. um but it's sadly no longer the case <laughs> unless you get down to sort of like the, the, the sort of like the lower leagues where it's probably still very much a classic game mm. Uh, but professionalism certainly changed that attribute. It really has, hasn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I don't know anything about rugby. <laughs> we were forced to watch rugby, actually. That was probably my big, biggest... Um, forced to watch it. Yeah, yeah. It, literally. Yeah. So we had to go down on a Saturday morning to watch watch the boys play rugby. But we, they didn't have to watch us play hockey, mm. which was interesting. <laughs> um but yes, yeah, so, so it was kind of just walking around the pitch going, yeah, he's hot, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> he's, oh, no. <laughs> just picking out your future husbands, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't comment. No. <laughs> but that was, that was the kind of, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't much fun. Berwick, cold. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Cumbria was wet and cold, but uh, you got used to it. Mm. Proper mud bath. Yeah. We didn't have to wear shorts, so we like to wear jumpers and yeah. trousers and yeah. things. Yeah, no, it was only shorts until the age of 13. Um, but I do remember that when I was at Seba, uh, only when you won your colours of any kind, be it sports or house colours, mm. were you allowed to have an umbrella. So <laughs> in, Cu- in Cumbria, where it rained 11 months of the year, you just got wet. Okay. You know, that was it. And, and, and if you had an umbrella, it was, you know, it was very bad. So um, only when you won your colours were you allowed an umbrella. That's amazing. Mm. Yeah, it is when you think back at you know, how things were back then. I know. It's insane. 
you know, I remember when the social services got involved in, yeah. pub, in boarding schools. Yeah, well, we things used, changed. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were surrounded by the Howgills, uh, which was a sort of like a, a hill range in that area. And as a punishment from your lower sixth, you could punish younger boys by making them run to the top of a, you know, 2,000 foot hill mm-hmm. and get a brass rubbing and come back down before breakfast. Um, <laughs> I never did that though. I was I was a nice guy. <laughs> so you yeah. developed your like a bit. Exactly. That's <laughs> the, that's the, other, that's the bribery element. I won't send you up there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that wasn't so long ago. You know, yeah. it's frightening to think of how times have changed mm. for the better, obviously. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see the pictures now of the <laughs> boarding school. You know, look at oh. the prospectus and everyone's, yeah, yeah. everyone's sat there with their iPads and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we used to have yeah. to line and stand in the queue for yeah. the phone and do yeah, yeah. the whole kind of. Will you accept this call? And <laughs> 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 the money. <laughs> Do reverse charges. Yeah. Now, I've been back a few times and we've actually recruited the um, marketing director of my old school suburb. Mm. I took out a, a, an ex colleague and put him in there for a couple of years. He did a great job there developing the brand mm. and, um, and, and you know, bring it into the, uh, uh, the, the, the modern day. But yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's quite archaic when you think back to what it was like. No, definitely. Definitely. Any other key subjects? I'm just <laughs> so, so looking back over all these all these things, I guess at the yeah. time we always talk about looking back, don't we, and connecting dots. As a child, you perhaps don't appreciate what you've gained from uh, boarding school, the structure, the procedure, the sport, commitment, persistence, training, mm-hmm. um, dedication to, I suppose, raising raising levels of performance. Mm. Um, if you could go back, if we Pull the DeLorean out front and <laughs> take you back back in time to a younger self, whether it's 18 or a bit younger. Mm. What do you think you sort of say to yourself? Um, what would I do differently or what would I say to myself? Mm. Um, I think one of the things that I mentioned before was about university. Um, mm. So for me it was about um, getting a degree um, and hopefully that was something that I was interested in and mm. enjoying my rugby and so on. Um, I think I'd have done a degree that would have maybe helped me a little bit more mm-hmm. in my career, mm-hmm. uh, something like management or business or something like that. Um, but of course, I didn't quite know what I wanted to be at that stage, mm. so that was probably mm-hmm. a little bit too early. Uh, yes. But who knows how that would have helped and just been a little bit more relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, when I started in recruitment, um, there was no recruitment qualifications per se. You didn't go to university to study recruitment, and mm. you know, recruitment was really you know sales understanding a need of a customer and then finding a solution and mm-hmm. uh, providing that solution through through the placement of a candidate. Mm. Um, so, you know, you're almost making that um, structure of a career as you go along. Um, one of the things that I would probably say to myself if I was to turn back time um, would be to have confidence in your own ability and not to worry because it'll be okay. Um, because mm-hmm. I always spent a huge amount of my childhood and university days and early career being concerned about achieving and the fear of failure mm-hmm. um, and continuously driving myself on you know, to overcome that. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, when you look back on good performance, you know, it's, it's pretty impressive what the human can do and, and what somebody with a relatively um, you know, good bit of training can come into a team and do and I've seen it over the years time and time and time again where, you know, bright, hard-working people join a team, work hard, um, you know, follow the, the guidance and uh, the direction um, and can be very, very success- successful. Um, and that's really rewarding. Mm. And, and, and here at McGregor Black, there's people that have contacted us that have selected our business out of all of the other recruitment firms in Newcastle. Mm-hmm who've relocated to come and work for us here because of the culture, because of the high performance ethics mm-hmm. and want to be part of that winning team. Um, and you see them developing and kicking on and making their first fees and then developing great relationships with clients and getting repeat business. And mm-hmm. over and over again, you're seeing success happen. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that gives you great um, peace of mind, you know, that you can continue to build teams and cultures that deliver that. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore that culture then bounces off itself and they love working together and they then you know create that buzz themselves and mm. when I'm not in the office and I'm away on holiday I come back and it's still mm. it's still flying you know mm-hmm. at, at top uh, at top height mm. um, so I think you know looking back you know maybe do something better at university university um, 
maybe you know not put too much pressure on myself and say it'll be okay have confidence it'll turn out you know good um but beyond that you know I wouldn't change really a great deal from from what I've done I'd have, I've enjoyed the journey mm. um if I'd have had another life maybe I'd have spent more time abroad I really enjoyed living abroad for 6 years um seeing different cultures and um a large part of my career was actually operating abroad as well. So from 2006 to 2013, I was only recruiting abroad outside of the UK. That was also really enjoyable. Um, mm. I was in the King's Own Royal Border Regiment for a number of years when I was a cadet. Um, and like my father, I would have probably spent a, a spell in the army for a period as well. Mm. Um, but that path was one that was offered to me when I left school to go to Sandhurst, but I decided not to. <laughs> um, I'd had enough institutionalisation. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I nearly uh, did that as well. I was, yeah. like, I, was like, I was like, oh no, I'm doing a master's instead. <laughs> so I thought, no, I'm going to, uh, I've, been, I've, I've been shouted at enough, so uh, it's, time, it's time, for, time for me to go and drink a little bit of beer and play some more rugby, I think. So um, I moved to Newcastle and that was it. Excellent. Yeah. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Um, so you can go onto our website, um, McGregor Black, um, and there is a contact us page there, um, and um, we'd be happy to talk to people as a candidate client or an employee, um, and pop in and have a coffee and, um, you know, have a chat. Awesome. Thank you very much Great. for joining us in, in your s- office today. Yes, my <laughs> pleasure. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Tom. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks everyone for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody.